please welcome Mary. Danse. I didn't know I was making my uh, film debut tonight. <laughs> so, um, gee, I told her, uh, um, do this side, eh? It's my best side. <laughs> oh, it's, I don't have a best side. Um, my name is, uh, like she said, Mary Cardinal Collins, and she told you a little bit of my... Um, I guess experience, um, but just to add to it, actually the the Haines Junction Yukon was like already five years ago. My bio is a little um, probably not up to date, but last um, spring I was uh, approached by Blue Quills, which, which is a, a registered university now. And uh, Blue Quills has a um, Cree language um, degree. Um, I, I think it's um, a bachelor. And um, one of the, the Cree language cohort, I was asked to teach Wahkutuan, uh, which is our topic tonight. So actually, um, um, it was, um, spring session course. So what I'm telling you tonight is very, very basic. And if you get a few main ideas about how kinship works, Wakotuan in Cree, um, uh, I guess that's my objective for the night. Um, one of the things that I really um, enjoyed uh, is um, my 86-year-old mother was uh, my TA uh, uh, during the course. And they were able to, um, I, don't, I don't know how they did it. it she just was. And um, don't ask me too many uh, complicated questions. Like, don't ask me, oh, this one is my uh, brother's wife's sister. How, what's her relationship, what's my relationship in Cree? I probably won't know. So um, just stick to really basics. <laughs> she was the one that handled that kind of stuff. And it actually was a really neat experience uh, for me, because I taught kind of the Western, um, but the added, um, what made it kind of unique, I think, in the academic world is I would talk about concepts in Cree and in English because half of the class was uh, fluent, which really, really helped. And um, so she would tell a story about, um, about the concept I was teaching on, and she would tell it in Cree because she doesn't um, speak a lot of English. So just um, kind of backtrack and tell you a little bit uh, about myself. Uh, I'm um, going on 71, so I don't want to stand here all night to tell you my life story. So I'll give you just the highlights. <laughs> I'm, uh, I was born to um, teenage parents, actually. My mom is only 15 years older than me, so I'll figure that out. Um, I, um, at the age of seven, I was sent to residential school. And um, so I'm a residential school uh, survivor. I didn't lose my language, and I'll, maybe I'll um, um, talk about it a little bit. And that was probably because my... Uh, Mom didn't speak any, any English. So a lot of kids lost their language in residential school. At the point when I went to residential school, kids weren't encouraged to speak it. But we kind of went underground, eh? So we used to speak it amongst ourselves. Because when I first went to school in 1953, I didn't know one word of English, not one word. So by Christmas, 
I was speaking maybe yes, no. <laughs> and, um, and it was really an immersion situation, I think. So by the end of the year, I was speaking a little bit of English. So the, the residential school story is another, um, another presentation I do. So I, I don't want to dwell on it a lot. Um, I spent 12 years in residential school, grade one to 12. So that's a part of my life, because um, I'm 70 now, figure the math. So it doesn't, that 12 month, 12 year period doesn't define me. I never let it define me, but I was lucky. The circumstances for me was that I was not um, abused. My mother couldn't um, speak any English, my teenage parents. My dad spoke some English because he was a product of a residential school. But my mom wasn't. She never went to school one day in her life. So that, um, that's kind of a unique uh, situation I was in. And um, I, didn't, I didn't lose my language. I would have been a better Cree speaker had I stayed home, but um, I didn't lose it altogether like a lot of people did. So just fast forward. Anyways, I, um, after high school, I got married. I had kids, and then after a while, I went back to uh, university and um, got my teaching degree, taught, was always uh, directed towards um, Cree because they were really short of um, Cree teachers. I didn't have any training to teach languages, but I was always, um, oh, here's a Cree speaker, let her teach um, Cree. So that's what happened to me. At first I was kind of like, I was really good in English and I wanted to teach English, but this Cree kept being put, up, put in, in front of me. So finally I, I um, accepted it and um, went on to work mostly in Cree and became a, a really um, advocate for Cree revitalization. So, so I was asked to teach this Wakutuan course. Wakutuan is the word for kinship in Cree. Um, and uh, Cree, of course, is Nehio, Nehioewen. A Cree is a Nehio. And uh, the language itself is um, Nehioewen. Okay. So, um, so now we'll talk about when um, in a Cree community, and um, this is not per se a historical presentation. The only way it's historical is I'll talk, um, I'll talk some about um, how it was in the 50s when I was growing up um, and how things were, how things are now, and why. Um, why this happened, especially with some of the relationships. There's been some change, of course, in uh, 30, 40 years, there's been change in, um, in the Wakutuan, on the, even on the reserve. Eh? So, um, how a person is related dictates, and, and this is in the old days, um, I'll let you know what, um, which ones are no longer being practiced as we go along, but some of them are still there, or we have remnants of it, uh, pieces of it that we still, we still practice. Um, how you, you were related in Cree country, Nihio? was how you interacted. It dictated how you interacted. 
Um, so I'll talk about a little bit about um, the 50s and how it was back then. The most important thing to remember in kinship and um, just, just overall, kinship is one of the most important um, value uh, concept in Cree culture. It's how the world, how the world turned in the, um, in the old days. We'll talk about cross and parallel cousins. And um, we have here, um, I have, uh, I guess, on the, um, on the board there, we have um, a, a chart on kinship systems. And uh, it makes a difference whether you're a male or a female, this one says isquesis, a girl, and makes a difference on what side, um, how you're related to someone. The next one is um, a, the, the boy, this one. And we'll, I'll come back to that later. Cousin terminology in Cree, uh, we talk about um, parallel, parallel cousins. Your parallel cousins are your brothers, um, your dad's brother's children. It's always the same sex um, uh, sibling. Or your mother's um, sister's children. Those are parallel cousins. And those, you acted towards them like they were your actual brothers and sisters. No difference. Um, the boys were highly esteemed, probably more than the girls. And they were um, treated very well. With respect, you didn't tell um, dirty jokes in front of them, like if uh, once you got older. So totally respectful, and just like your own brothers and sisters. Um, same with your um, female parallel, they were just like your sisters. You had your um, kimosom, and uh, I'll try and say it nimosum, because uh, you're always talking about you, eh? Nimosum, because kimosum is yours. That's why um, sometimes people use the word kokum, for instance. It means your grandmother. Kokum. But I, it, be, it became a um, kind of anglicized, so now Everybody says kokum, but I think maybe 30 years ago, people were talking about um, kokum. That's your, your kokum, your, your grandma. So kids kind of uh, picked it up to mean grandmother, but actually it means your grandmother. My grandmother is nokum. Okay. The other one that's been anglicized a little bit is musum. People say now, eh, musum. You hear that? Kokum. Those are um, kind of anglicized versions of... Um, speaking of anglicized, another one is chapan. You hear that too? That's your great grandma. And that one is genderless. So it could be boy or girl. Chapan, your Chapan. And um, that one too has become a little bit um, anglicized because you would say Nichapan, Nichapan, with um, the um, possessive, yours, possessive. Things are uh, quite different in English. Um, 
your, um, for instance, um, I'll probably go back here. Oh, this is the boy. You have here, um, um, you have Nemasom Nokum on one side, and then you have Notawi Nikawi, is your mom and dad. And then you have Nikawis and Notawis. Like even that is um, those two words uh, mean little mother or little um, father. And even that is telling because those people, your aunties and your uncles, they could take the place of your, um, especially in discipline, they could take the place of your mom and dad. In fact, they help your mom and dad in a small community to um, discipline the kids. And again, I say it means little mom, little dad. And my uh, chief word would be, um, uh, some people use it, nimamasis. Or in uh, Nigau, instead of Nigawi, people would say Nimama. It's half French, eh? But um, the classic Cree word is um, Nigawi. And when you call somebody, when you call your mother, you can say um, um, Nega, Niga you know, with the northern pronunciation. That's called a vocative. That means you're calling them. So that's a Cree word maybe some of you have heard. The other one is nohta. You're calling your dad. Nohta. You leave out the nohta, we, that little part. Um, and your um, siblings, your older brother, Nistes, your older sister is Nimis, and your um, younger brothers and sisters are um, uh, genderless. It's the same word, Nisimis, Nisimis. My um, younger brother, or sister. I have a little story with that. Um, my auntie was, a re we used to call her Mama Sis. She was the only one we called that in our family because my Nohkum uh, was um, a Metis woman and she spoke um, Mechif sometimes, not all the time. So we said Nimama and Papa. And uh, my auntie was uh, Nimamasis. And uh, she, another thing in Cree is you never use people's names. You always refer to people by how you're related. Okay, for instance, Ntans, my daughter. Ntsims, my, my younger sister or younger brother. They never said their names. Names were kind of considered sacred. They, uh, they weren't bandied about um, just loosely, eh? just um, very, um, um, you just call people by how you were related. So my auntie, the mama, sis, we called her, she was already an old lady and Never, ever would she name anybody. She'd always say, Gamama, or when she's referring to Nsim uh, Sak, my uh, younger sisters, she'd say, um, she wouldn't say the name, eh? so I kind of have to wait for her to give more information. And she said, Kasim Sanaya, Hobima, Kawigit. In those days, it was called Hobima. But I had three sisters that were in Hobima. So again, you have to wait, and then she'd say, Anaya, 
Tigaya Meskana Kawiget, the one there that lives close to the road. Now you'd, now you'd be able to zero in on who it was, but they just refused to uh, uh, name people by, uh, they refused to name people, period. Um, that kind of changed, um, a lot of things changed at residential school because um, you were there with um, um, your peers, you knew who you were related to. At residential school, um, when I was there, I knew which ones were my first cousins. And um, see, your first cousin, their role was to um, back you up. If you ever got into a fight, they'd back you up right there, boy. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, uh, everybody had roles. You didn't ignore somebody. Just because you were in residential school, you, ignore, you um, acknowledged the relationship. So um, again, just reiterating, it seems, is genderless. It's... Um, some people even say in seems in seems squeal. My uh, female younger sibling. Cause in seems only means sibling, yeah? Doesn't mean brother or sister. If you're not using names, that is. Um, now, this uh, page uh, um, actually is from the Cree Literacy Network, it's called. I was, um, uh, Ed, Ed was asking me if uh, I could give a handout, and I don't have paper handouts, but uh, that is um, when you're Googling, that's the, the site. Cree Literacy Network has loads of information on all kinds of uh, stories in Cree, all kinds of things pertaining to Cree. One of the other um, interesting relationships is, um, they were called distant relationships. And these don't, they don't, um, some of them, some communities still practice it, but not a whole lot. And that is um, people that are, um, you don't talk to. Okay, there were people you weren't allowed to talk to. And those were your in-laws. Um, a daughter-in-law would not be able to speak to their father-in-law. And um, I think it, um, uh, like the when we got into discussions about that, people were saying, "Well, it's a matter of respect." I think a lot of it too is. Um, there's a value in Cree called Mioijetun. And these are small, small communities, eh? So they needed to get along, not get into arguments. And when you're distant with somebody or you're not talking to them, and it's not because you're angry with them, it's just that it's not, it's not allowed, then you don't get into um, any kind of uh, arguments. You know, all the... In mainstream, there's a lot of jokes about um, mother-in-law jokes, eh? Well, you didn't, in Cree, you wouldn't have any mother-in-law jokes. <laughs> I guess <laughs> there was never any interaction. So um, I think um, in the 50s, and at residential school, that was um, one, um, one uh, way of doing things that was probably forgotten, or s let's skip on this. Um, uh, there's some. There's a lot of stories from the old days about how people, how people, um, how in-laws communicated with each other. A lot of it was. Um, the daughter would go and speak to the mother. Somebody would speak for you. Okay? 
awiak kai to esta mask but in uh, there was times when you d you had no choice say eh? so here's here's one little story there's a couple of stories that um, my my mother shared with us one is um i think it's a Salt Lake story where this um this couple, well, the mother-in-law was home alone, nobody else around, and the son-in-law was next door and his, um, her daughter, no, her granddaughter, uh, went into labor, and she was the midwife, the old lady. So he goes in, and he says, um, he doesn't know what to do, eh, because she's home alone. And so he says, um, he addresses the cat that's th sitting by. And he said, cat, um, I think my wife is in labor. <laughs> in Cree, of course. And um, she never said a word. She just packed up her stuff and followed him. Another story is um, this um, couple, again, son-in-law, uh, mother-in-law, were home alone for a couple of days. Everybody had gone someplace, and and um, so he went in. She used to cook for him, eh? Like she wouldn't ignore him, or there was no contact like that. She would cook for him, but there would be no words exchanged. So he comes in and he says, uh, and she says, talking to herself instead of to him. And she said, oh, wouldn't it be nice if somebody went and watered the horses, she said. <laughs> so he knew, he knew what to do. He went and watered the horses. Those were um, just extreme examples. Um, those were also examples of um, indirect, indirect um, conversation, I guess you could call it, but they're called distant relationships. Another one that's um, not um, really talked about in English um, is Manat um, Magana. The two sets of in-laws. And um, they were called Nimanatimagan. Somebody who um, um, don't, you're, you're afraid, or not afraid, but you're, you kind of step real lightly around them because there's a potential for, uh, for um, conflict there, eh? So those were also distant relationships. Other relationships in the community were Nikoyame, 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 and both of those were those words are um, genderless. It could be a man or a woman, and um, that is uh, same name. Say if. Um, both uh, Mary and, well, it is kind of, but suppose her name was Mary too. I could call her Nigoeme. That would be a relationship you could, uh, you have in the community. The other one is, um, and, uh, uh, the idea that um, say if you had if you had an ex ex wife or ex boyfriend there is a you can call that person by for between women it was called ntaim and between uh, men it was um, nikosak I think right ne it's Nikosak, yeah. So there, there were words for that, for your, um, your um, ex or your, your rival or, um, and you kind of 
I think stayed away from these people. <laughs> the next one is, um, I want to talk about is uh, Tapajutun, which is um, a kind of an adoption. For instance, if I, um, if somebody say, um, say my sister passed away and there's a kid running around the community that looks like her or reminds me of her, I could say, you could go to that uh, person and say, you look like my sister. Sometimes a gift was presented and from now on you're going to be my sister, it seems, or whatever, whatever the relationship is. Um, so that was Tapahutu, uh, and there's all kinds of examples of Tapahutu. Uh, Are there any questions? No? Yeah? Yeah. And I think that's sort of the newer version of Yeah, Ntans. Yeah. Ntans, my, do my uh, daughter. Um, my girl. Um, what else was there I was thinking about? It's kind of, um, um, it's Cree. It's English, but it's um, Cree uh, terminology. Uh, there's more, like in the bush, that's another, it's not a wakutu in word, but say, um, people always say, oh, I'm working in the bush. That's a Cree way of uh, explaining it, sagak, <laughs> I think, anyway. Um, the word, uh, nesisi. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's uh, vocative, eh? What you call them. Okay, um, I'm going back to um, either one of these. Um, and I wanted to talk to you about um, which one of your cousins you can marry. Okay. The ones there that are... Um, that are bordered by um, by red. Those are your all your parallel cousins. The ones there that are in green on the side. There's uh, you say in Sagos for my aunt, your um, cross cousin, your cross cousin relatives, or your cross cousin um, cousins, cross cousin cousin. And um, your aunt on that side is in Sigus, and your uncle is in Sis. Those are also the same words for mother-in-law and father-in-law. So my opinion is that um, these people that are across um, your cross cousins, after thousands of years of observation, I think that the Crees knew that um, there would be, um, you could marry them without uh, consequences like diseases and that. Uh, they were, they were, it was probably a sound eugenic uh, practice, because you could, those ones. I know with uh, me, with my cross cousins, uh, I get totally turned off. <laughs> I thought, ick! <laughs> but uh, in a small community, and um, if, you know, we don't have any choice. I mean, people are trying to get married out of the, of the community so that the gene pool is not uh, too, uh, too close for um, all the genetic possibilities of disease and stuff like that. So I think 
I think they knew that this side here, right on the extreme side, which are your cross relatives, I think those were, you could marry those people. So, um, just by the terminology, uh, nobody's told me that, but I think, um, uh, well, I have read stuff where, um, where these, these were uh, allowed, you were allowed to marry that side. So, and in the old days, they used to um, marry people off, eh? They would choose their partner from uh, when they were kids. And um, any other questions? Thought you were going to ask me a question, Polly. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'll ask you a question. Um, now, when you talk about this word, you said you saw you. I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. My mom, there's this young girl, mm -hmm. that was born. My mm -hmm. dad finds it, oh, he called her his wife. Oh, yeah. Baby. So my mom always called her Italian. Yeah. Is that kind of thing? Yeah, right? same thing. Okay. And it's kind of a joke, um, joke, because. Um, Old men, in the old days, uh, these old men used to uh, tease the little girls. Some of these things we're talking about, about being distant and that, those uh, kind of practices um, were to, um, not, to not encourage um, sexual abuse. Okay, men, um, for instance, were, um, didn't, um, they could hold a baby in arms, in their arm, for a certain time, and after that, they kind of ignored them, because it, it was a close-knit, people lived in the same lodge, and those were, uh, those kind of practices were to deter sexual abuse. Um, old men, or mature men used to um, tease the girls. Uh, I used to, there is an old man in uh, Sad Lake, and um, he used to call me his wife, and I just hated him, eh? Because I was maybe five or six, and um, the, the old people would kind of play along, and, oh, this is your wife, blah, 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 ki waha wa, and, um, but uh, it was more of a teasing thing, so people would be related, like she said, dying. That would be her relationship with that girl. And that was just kind of a joking relationship. A lot of, um, I don't know if you noticed, a lot of um, young people nowadays, they're little uh, grandchildren become their kokums, or they'll say no kum, or um, some these little kids. So it's just that reinforcing that um, relationship. And they would forever, or in, during their life, that would be the relationship um, to that child, even though that child is only maybe five years old or six years old, that's your kumasung. When you did the tapakutun, the adoption, your, um, your whole life now, you treat that person with um, the way you're supposed to interact with them. For instance, with me, there's a couple of uh, principles where I, where I work. Both of those principals call me uh, Nimis, which is my older sister. Now I have to act like an older sister. And, um, and they have to treat me like an older sister. It's a term of um, respect, but I can't, um, uh, for instance, tell off-color jokes in front of them. I can't be disrespectful to them. So that um, interaction, if it is a 
Tapakotuan, an adoption situation, they took that um, very seriously. And um, so it wasn't something light, taken lightly. Oh, it's my sister or whatever, eh? So, yeah. Um, what else was I going to say? Just forgot, I guess, for the minute. Hmm? Kikwai? No comes? There's a few words in, um, that are different. And no comes actually is an old word for uncle. And it's not used very much around here. I know about it. Another word is ntusis. Uh, the northern Saskatchewan people, uh, the Métis use those words. But it's not really a Plains Cree word that's used around here. Yeah, could be. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Who's talking? Oh, Karen. Yeah, it probably is. Because a lot of our, um, for instance, my great-grandfather was um, Anishinaabe, so I'm pretty sure the terms get all got mixed up in the Cree and whatever. But, yeah. Yeah? Uh, like the, uh, your, your, uh, your aunt on your mother's side, mm -hmm. their children, you're supposed to they're your brothers and sisters. Uh, they, they, mm -hmm. they, they mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, in English, they're your cousins. Yeah. But in, in, uh, in the Cree, they're your, your children, mm -hmm. your brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. yeah. I notice on uh, Facebook and um, social media, a lot of the, I have a lot of Cree speakers in my. Uh, on my, um, as friends, friends. <laughs> anyway, uh, they're, uh, a lot of times they'll say my sister cousin, and that's just to differentiate, um, um, like some people just use the word sister, but you never know if it's a blood relative or they're calling them that because they're in the same club or whatever, eh? Because it's written, eh? But a lot of, uh, I notice a lot of people are, um, are uh, writing sister cousin, brother cousin, that kind of uh, differentiation when they're talking to somebody or talking about, yeah? I have a question about that, like I say, I say uh, brother cousin to my mom's twins, kids, mm -hmm. and that's why I ask them that. But I think uh, a lot of people misunderstand that. Mm -hmm. They call each other sister. Yeah. 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 Okay. And it's sister, like you belong in the same club, something like that? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. um, we call each other um, brothers, 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 and sisters. We call each other that. Mm -hmm. Because my mom is the female, my, my uncle is the uh, male. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my um, I think I've I uh, kind of missed out on um, cross cousins. I thought I had uh, um, talked about it. Cross cousins are your um, remember we talk I talked about parallel same sibling. Your cousins that are your um, brothers. Um, your dad's brother, they're the same sex, eh? Your dad's brother and your um, mom's sister, same sex. Those are parallel. But your um, cross cousins are the opposite. Your uh, dad's sister's kids or your um, mom's brother's kids. Those are your cross relatives. And those are different. They're... Um, you treat those people different. You can joke, you can laugh, they can be, um, and I'll get back to that later, kichamos, kind of maybe kissing cousins, uh, where it came from. Nichamos um, is nitim. 
your in-law. But it's on uh, the side of the the side that Greece can um, have a relationship, have a, can marry on that side. Your cross cousins. So. Mm -hmm. What do you call them, your cross cousins? Like, how do you refer to them? Like, you would call my, like, my mom's sister's kids. That'd be like names and things, right? Yeah. But what do I call my, uh, my mom's brother's kids? I have to look on here. Um. I'm not sure. Hey, um, Mr. Nathan. Nathan. Yeah. Where's um, Mr. Um, yeah. Mr. Quinn? Mr. Quinn. Hello, Mr. Quinn. Mr. Mr. Quinn, help. For the woman, if your mom's, your mom's brother's daughter, for you, woman, your mom's brother's daughter, or your dad's sister's daughter, you would call that one Nitsa Kus. And it comes from Atta, which means spirit, kind of like a soul sister. Uh, and then for the, the men, the guys in here, your mom's brother's son, or your dad's sister's son, you would call those ones Nisas. Nisas, which is a diminutive of Nistao. Oh, yeah. And Nistao is also um, a word, um, maybe kind of in a joking way. Um, a lot of uh, people that were new to town, say if you were a Cree community in the 17th century or whatever, and this white trapper comes in, a lot of people called him Nistao. Because they always had to have a, a reference uh, uh, on how to interact with them. So it start, kind of started out maybe as a joke, but um, people with the, new, the newbies in town, a male, they were all potential. They were potential um, son-in-laws, sons-in-law. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Except, no other questions? What other interesting... Um, yeah? Nitimus is a diminutive for Nitam, and that is your, um, your cross cousin. So it be, it's one of these words that have changed over time, and um, um, now it means sweetheart or potential sweetheart or whatever, but it, it's actually Nitim, and um, when you demunitize um, nitim, it's nitimus. I think, eh? Because uh, my, his dad, uh, Ruben's dad, was uh, my mom's witama. And um, he gave her a big lecture about um, that word, eh? And she always talks about it. Because she used to, she didn't like it when he called her Nismas. And she thought um, it was inappropriate, but it's, it's very appropriate. But it's us over time that have, have um, changed that word. What was your question? Um, what would you call oh. your lover or your husband? Okay. Um, there's a couple of words. Nuitewagan um, is um, my buddy or my person I go around with. Nuitewaw. Um, Niwa is my my wife. 
And what's another one? No to go in Sagi Hagen, I guess. My lover, my lover. <laughs> lover boy? Yeah. <laughs> hey, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> I was going to look in here. This, um, I have this book. This is my own copy of uh, 100 Days of Cree by Neil McLeod. Nui Gimagan is another one. Um, oh, he, you know what he wrote is uh, Nitsquem, my woman, and my husband is Ninapem, my man. Mm -hmm. Pardon me? Ninapem, Ninapem, my man. I think there's a song. <laughs> oh, uh, yes. Is there a wording for my grandparents? Yeah. Can't think of any. Unless you say, um, Gihteim, my elders. Gihteim. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe some, some, uh, yeah? Oh, I knew you were going to ask me that. Gee. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'll be just really blunt. I was just having a conversation with Ed here. I said, oh, that's the stuff I don't know about uh, two spirit and uh, those kinds of terms. And uh, I don't. Um, you you had um, said something to me. Well, first I say they use the uh, two people. Yeah. Two sp two twins, eh? Niso deal. Niso deal. Yeah. Okay. Oh, another one that I I've forgotten is um, this whole word uh, Nichi. Okay. Nichi is. Um, kind of the anglicized uh, uh, term of uh, Nietzsche, somebody that's Nietzsche. For example, you can tease somebody and say, um, Nietzscheaya, Nietzsche Pusakwam, just being silly. Um, this person and I, we both like to sleep in, is what you're saying, Nietzsche Pusakwam. Or you say Nietzsche Maxugan, and you—that's your name, eh? That's your relationship, uh, my fellow um, big butt Nietzsche Maxugan. <laughs> but that's a kind of a teasing relationship. But there are uh, a, a little bit more serious ones, and they say Nietzsche, this Nietzsche Nietzsche Obstagon. Somebody that has white hair. Both you and I have white hair. The uh, prefix in front is Nietzsche. And I think the word Nietzsche, which is kind of a, a general term for an indigenous person, I think. And uh, that's where that word came from. Nietzsche. Word. We're the same, you and I. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it also um, it denotes some humility, right? Yeah. 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 Like, it's a demox or like, both poor. Yeah. And um, yeah. Fellow, mm -hmm. fellow pov pover poverty written person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that kind. So. Eka, a twenty to eight. Holy cow! Keep going. This one's about my mom's cousin's daughter. That's kind of a second different, you know. Yeah. How do you refer to them? I'm not sure. Um, no, komaga na, maybe. Um, 
my just my relatives. Um, I think maybe those are the ones that you would uh, define in a new in a new way. Our Nijaya, whatever, or Tap the Tapaku Mate. Does anybody, maybe somebody knows? Skate in? Yeah. Yeah. You're related. Um, even if it's second. Yeah. And that uh, that Japan I was um, talking about on Skutapan, um, I think that's it, they're referring almost to chains, eh? Uh, or one generation. Your Japan, ans, uh, the word the word Japan comes from Anskutapan. We kind of um, anglicized it. So, and your Japan can be the old person and the young person. So that word is very versatile. <laughs> mm -hmm. So did he, did he answer your question, do you think? Yeah, I think so. Like, I'm thinking about, like, you know my family, right? Mm -hmm. Like, my aunt is born of Sandy Shore and them. So I'm pretty close to them. Yeah. They're actually my second or third family. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Hey, the other question is, you talk about the Japan, right? I always wonder about, for example, third generation, right? Yeah. You know, like Niso, Nis, do you say Niso or Nsto and Skutapan? Yeah. So you would say second, because uh, actually, um, uh, Utapan is um, like a generation, eh? So we would say two times ni swal or three times ni swal. Eko? Kiko ay mina? Yeah. Your grandmother and your grandmother. Yeah. Ne Mosom. Yeah. Because I was saying Mosom is kind of the anglicized uh, version of Ne Mosom. Yeah. So you would say Ne. All the ones that are you're talking my, they're all uh, prefix N I. Mine. Ne, 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 ne. And all the yours are Ke. Ke Mosom. Um, Kusimak, Kusisimak, Ku, K. But if you're you're uh, talking to them or you're talking about them, no system. There's the N, and then there's the K for yours. Yeah. Aksuchi. Uh -huh. I was thinking, honey, how like over time, um, over time, how things have changed, and how um, how uh, indigenous like uh, beliefs and thoughts have changed over time. And I remember um, I had an uncle who, when the woman would come and visit, he would mm -hmm. go into the bedroom. Yeah. And uh, everybody would think that he was being snobby. Mm-hmm. Oh, he's showing respect. Giving them alone time. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I, I remember those teachings were lost. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. The um, thing about the distant, uh, you know, not talking to your... Uh, when that uh, kind of disappeared from the customs was when people moved away to the city or moved away to another community. So they didn't have to be distant in a small space. Eh? So that kind of got... Uh, the other thing with distant relations is um, the son-in-law or the daughter-in-law, they're not supposed to even touch that person. They're, um, it's their, like I remember um, this one lady said um, her, her uh, son-in-law was, um, her son-in-law was uh, non, non-Indigenous and he said, he came over and he said, hi there or something like that and was, oh, you know, that was a big shock, <laughs> Linda Old Pen. And, um, so uh, th- there's all kinds of um, um, even, um, what do you call that, um, body language? Like even if you say something, I don't know if you remember this from the old days, and an old lady said something inappropriate or something, and they'd go like this, you know, like shut my mouth, you know. so. That was, uh, a lot of it is uh, uh, body language. Um, we we um, practiced all that stuff when we were in residential school, eh? And it was, we went underground, but it was, it was there. I remember we used to um, be able to, one of the signs of confrontation in Cree is to stare at somebody. Lock your, lock eyes. So you, um, people used to be real good at, it's called um, in Cree, and they, they'd lock eyes and then they'd go like this. <laughs> it was a real, a real skill. And you knew we were in uh, trouble with that person. <laughs> so a lot of it is body language too. And how you related, like I said, your uh, relatives were the ones that backed you up. If you got into difficulty, boy, mm-hmm. was your first cousins. <clears throat> Nowadays, uh, uh, our uh, people on the reserves, uh, I don't have this one open. Yeah. Relations uh, a lot of our old people say uh, they're not to be married. Yeah. People are not to be yeah. married to one another. Yeah. Mm-hmm. First cousin. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And a lot of our uh, people, even in those as urban, urban areas, don't even know uh, the, uh, the sacredness of uh, Aboriginal Rehwakotun. Rehwakotun, yeah. 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 So, I agree. Um, and you don't know if you're... you're you don't even know if you're related. Yeah. yeah. And the, the other thing is, um, I, I remember hearing this a long time ago, is uh, when you're related to somebody, because of their facial construction, you are attracted to them, because they're your relatives. So a lot of times these uh, people, like adoptees, they'll meet somebody and they don't know their background and they're really attracted, well, they might be really closely related. Because that's, um, it's a fact that it's called, um, isn't it called, um, consanguity, which is blood. Your, the blood attracts um, a person to you. So, likely to happen, especially if you don't know your background. And it could also be used um, 
could be used to your detriment. Every time you bring a girl home or a boy home, they'll say, Ma, you're related to them. <laughs> that may, might not even be true. <laughs> it's don't, they just don't like them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah? Yeah. So what direction is the Cree language going in now that it seems it appears that a lot of, a lot of the words are getting anglicized? Um, are the dialects going to go like melding as one? No. Um, um, words being anglicized and words being changed, that's normal evolution of uh, any language. That happens in Italian, in English, whatever. So that's, that's, that'll happen anyway. But there is, um, I see a real, um, um, like even this, this whole idea of even talking about this here, there's a real drive to um, revitalization of the language. Um, when I go to Blue Quills, which is like, they're, they're the ones that are offering that um, bachelor for Cree language, um, there's a lot of, um, I see Cree all over the place. And it does my heart good, but even like, um, um, ceremonies included. People smudge before they go to classes. Um, they uh, say a prayer, which happens in a, maybe in a small space like this, but it doesn't happen at U of A, for instance. Uh, one of the things I noticed at U of A is they're always complaining about allergies. To me, I think that's just an excuse. <laughs> so, anyway, um, there's... I think, uh, like even the amount of um, Cree courses, different kinds of courses in Edmonton and other communities, I think, I think that's a good sign that we'll keep some of it. Some of it changes, that's, that's normal for any language. But um, I hope that we keep uh, uh, we keep uh, a lot of it, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yes? I'm thinking about um, this question and the two spirit question earlier, and I've heard that there's seven genders in three, and how do we like, just return to that knowledge, or like find a way to access it again if that means figuring out what that means because I'm not finding out to know that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't know, but maybe somebody, somebody else knows. I know, for instance, um, it's not um, it's not impossible because one of the things that I'm doing this year is um, I'm doing this indigenous uh, social work and I do a language lab once, uh, once a month with the students, about 30 students. And um, one, of them, one of my job, job uh, objective is to develop a lexicon, develop vocabulary for social work um, related type of uh, jargon or language. So if they can do that for, um, for something like social work or um, I think another one is um, um, the ones there that have doulas, uh, midwifery. So 
maybe they can do that for uh, uh, this type of uh, sexual there's degrees in sexuality yeah so uh, I could see it happening but I, I myself I don't know I remember we did um We were pretty um, still in the uh, Middle Ages, I think, in our thinking. Um, when we did the validation for Aboriginal studies, we were supposed to include two spirits in there. And uh, so we um, validated it with the elders. And every, most of the elders, I'd say 99%, said we don't have homosexuality in our, we don't have two spirit people in our community. So I think it's um, early days for that, but it might come, I would think. The, um, I think the Sioux or Nakoda had words for uh, all of those um, degrees of sexuality. So maybe we can develop one so it, so it'll be all inclusive, eh? Do you know? Do you know what? if there are words for uh, the different kinds of um, sexual, sexual sexuality uh, in Cree? I imagine there are, but uh, we don't hear them used at all because it's not a, a subject that is uh, discussed in the community too much of yeah. sexuality um, unless you're gossiping about uh, some essential practice. Uh, and uh, you know, that doesn't help. Um, yeah. But I know that there's some. Some Indian Aboriginal nations uh, uh, accept uh, <coughs> um, uh, homosexuality, like the, the Sioux people, yeah. the Sioux Indian uh, nations, uh, uh, a person that was uh, homosexual was uh, revered mm -hmm. as a god, mm -hmm. uh, a gift from, from God. Mm -hmm. So uh, they were highly, and it's still they. Very highly respected in their, in their society. Mm -hmm. the yeah. yeah. But I don't think Crees are there yet. Right? I don't think Crees are there yet. Uh, well, the thing is, I think that uh, the church has a lot to do with the, uh, the, the, the Crees are uh, putting down the homosexuality. That is caused by the, the church. Mm -hmm. It's a terrible thing that's happened to, to our society, our free society. Aboriginal people where the church has influenced uh, uh, the culture in a bad way. So. Mm -hmm. Hey, hey. Yes? Uh, thank you for coming. Um, I just wanted to ask about the Ah. Um, when you referred to said it was a kind of an adoption, yeah. was that adoption of another Indigenous person? Or not really? It didn't matter. Didn't matter who. Could be a non-Indigenous person. So if it was a non-Indigenous person, they would be accepted as the yeah. Indigenous? Yeah, yes. Even though, like nowadays, the Indian Act wouldn't acknowledge them as being status. Because if I yeah, to yeah. Um, there is a number of uh, indigenous individuals in our community that don't have a, any blood quantum of um, Cree, but they were adopted as children. And um, uh, one of them was um, a man called Steve Woodford. And he was a Ukrainian 
as a baby, his parents couldn't take care of him, so they gave them to this uh, Whitford couple. They were a Métis Cree, and they took the child and raised him as um, their own. And he never, like he was totally separated from the, he never even went back. And he was accepted as a, a Cree person. He died about uh, four or five years ago and uh, left uh, like um, married on the reserve and spoke fluent Cree. And so it's not, a lot of times it's not blood quantum, um, but it's um, how, you were, how you were brought up. Language, I think, is so important. You know, you could be the most... Uh, there's, there's another man in uh, Frog Lake. He's uh, known as a medicine man. He told me uh, he was a Danish. He doesn't have a drop of uh, Cree blood. So, but him himself, too, he was uh, adopted as a baby. Nobody ever said, well, you're a white man, you can't be here. It's all language, eh? A lot of times. Yes? Do you think that you think so much, Mary, mm -hmm. uh, for people who share with us? Um, I organize a group of students at the University of Alberta who are pushing for the University of Alberta to make Indigenous content mandatory for every new student enrolling in a degree yeah. program or certificate. Um, and a part of that means that like the university is going to gain a lot more indigenous knowledge. And we're trying to ensure that the university like collects that knowledge and disseminates it and shares it in a way that is accountable to First Nations Métis Inuit people um, and knowledge holders and elders. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you have any advice as to like how we create those knowledge-based relationships um, in, a, in, in a way that we like recognize the sacredness. I don't know. That's a hard question. Geez, I hate it when people ask me hard questions. <laughs> and I have to think. <laughs> Jeez. Um, I think there's um, uh, other jurisdictions or other universities that have done it. Um, they just need to visit those people. Um, for instance, um, what happens at Blue Quills? You have a, your smudge every day. And, um, they've uh, one of the things Blue Quills has done is, um, well, like for instance, my course. My mom was my TA. That would never happen anywhere else. I don't think. And she's the one that knows these things. I'm just her, I'm, I'm her TA actually. <laughs> so, um, not to be so bureaucratic. Um, let people do their own thing, like um, what their knowledge is, instead of trying to control it from the top. I don't know what's the practical way to do that. And um, use a uh, ceremony. Ceremony as, um, there's a book called Ceremony as Research. I'm sure you're aware of it. So things like that, I think. Mm, yeah. Like the way that you incorporate the education so it's hands-on experience 
Mm-hmm. I remember one um, one course, and I think it was University of Lethbridge. It was a Native Studies course, and the prof would um, ask the students to spend twenty four hours in an isolated in the country, in the bush, in the back, in the dark. <laughs> so I think that's a good experiential. I don't know if I don't know if somebody still does that. Just drop them off in uh place to leave late there. <laughs> That's bold, <laughs> well, so what? <laughs> you pass your you pass your grade if you don't get eaten by a bear. <laughs> oh, pass. <laughs> so Hey, <laughs> what? Um, um, yeah. well, we talk about this like language and relationships, what for true and that sort of thing, but um, sometimes we overlook the um, significance of the terminology, the connection between the language, the strong connection between the language and the culture. Yeah. And I think that's something about it. Um, I think in our Western education system, we forget about that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like Little that, mother. Yeah, there's just a, this term that it's just a word in English if you have a word, but yet in see there's all these connotations that are you know mm-hmm. attached to it. Yeah. And I think those are some of the things that we're not I think sharing. The other day, um, I was just talking with a teacher, um, just recently I'm doing some work for this contract work. And we're talking about what what education could look like from a uh, from uh, an indigenous perspective. Mm-hmm. And so we're talking about this thing, so I was not coming from a pedagogical approach, but more about epistemology, because that's what mm-hmm. it's coming from. But yet it was really hard to differentiate between the two when you think about indigenous culture. And we're talking about some of those things. One thing she said to me was, she's what's the practice in an elementary kindergarten program? And I've never heard this term before, because I'm not, I was not a very elementary teacher. But uh, was it elbow, elbow to knee, elbow to knee, or something? The way that you sit in a classroom, where you just cross your legs, yeah. elbows on your knees, I guess that's what it means. Mm-hmm. And we're talking about the cultural significance of that as women, like little girls, you know, you don't yeah. see that way. Yeah. Yet it's kind of practice. It's not on the agenda, but it's kind of practice with the universe. Yeah. So basically to maintain sufficient control. Yeah. And so, but there's a whole cultural part of that. And I was explaining to her, she said, well, one of the things, too, that um, even like my grandchildren, my grandsons, yeah. And talking to them both down. And my granddaughter was saying, I've been a little girl, and say, they're all laying down watching TV, and she'd kind of step over them. Mm-hmm. And that teaching, you don't step over them. There's cultural mm-hmm. significance, even so it's cultural practice. Mm-hmm. And I think that's something, too, when you talk about language, the free language, you don't talk about the cultural significance of why those words, where they come from. Yeah. And I guess it's having a spiritual part of the language, I think, that, that's sort of missing. Too. Mm-hmm. So I just think that's something we also have to start talking about those things too, like what these terminology, what this means, and how it, what it means as being an idiot. You know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I hear. You. I find that uh, it's very rare uh, where uh, you can find. Uh, <coughs> Families or uh, Aboriginal uh, communities are uh, yeah, uh, practicing uh, the old style uh, relationship. Uh, mm-hmm. Where a, 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 a brother in law uh, who will not talk to uh, yeah. his uh, mother in law, mm-hmm. or if they do practice that, you seldom hear have, uh, have someone. Uh, would you say this to my mother-in-law? Yeah. He said, ask someone else. Yeah. Ask. You don't see this uh, very often uh, in relationships. Mm-hmm. In too many uh, Aboriginal uh, uh, family situations today. And there is even that on the reserve. Uh, uh, I only saw that kind of relationship maybe 
about uh, 30 years ago, yeah. when we were still uh, a lot of the uh, uh, old people still practice their their uh, traditions, their mm -hmm. Aboriginal traditions. But, uh, you seldom, seldom see this in in uh, the Aboriginal community nowadays. Mm -hmm. I don't know uh, whether that's good or bad. Yeah. I think maybe I'll even say um, probably even less in urban, urban situations. But on the uh, parts of the reserve too is uh, really, um, although the relationships are there, it's not practiced anymore. Eh? Like even, even if the, all the material is there, like all the, the relationships are still there. But yeah, I think it has to be a, um, a conscious drive to do that. There's a lady and there's, a, there's um, a family in Saskatchewan, of course, Saskatchewan. <laughs> He's from Saskatchewan. I'm just, I'm just trying to... Uh... Anyway, the um, no... English is allowed. Um, the, where's uh, Where's Reuben? Oh, remember that? What's the name of that um, family that um, doesn't allow any uh, English? What in Saskatchewan? Pardon me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I think I have to. Um, the community itself has to um, uh, push for something like this. Um, like I've often thought, um, my mom's still alive, she's very fluent, eh? And she doesn't, she speaks broken English to her um, grandchildren. And I told her, why don't you speak Cree to them? But you know, like I say that, but I don't practice it either. Not, not all the time, you know. So it has to be, you have to try really hard, I think, to uh, push for something like that. One thing that I notice as I get older um, is that uh, the language, the teachings, um, how we refer to each other, ceremonies, uh, all those things are all very interconnected. Mm -hmm. It's not one or the other, there's no real full practice or learning. It's not complete. Yeah. And so without really not, so I don't speak my language, I know very little. I know some ceremonial words, because I do lots of ceremony. Yeah. I know some regular kind of stuff I recognize, and so I have an idea of what people are saying. But without really knowing that language, I don't feel really complete to know all my ceremonies or to, to be able to pray in my language or to be able to interact in a way that's those old ways without having that language there. And so it's always left me feeling a little bit incomplete without having all that. Mm -hmm. So I think language is very critical and very key to having that feeling of completion as an Aboriginal person. Yeah. Um, because, you know, I live on reserve. I'm very proactive in our Aboriginal community about having uh, us as Aboriginal people acknowledged for who we are. I'm very well rehearsed in attending ceremonies and, and you know, that kind of thing. But there's still always that feeling of incompletion because I don't know my language very well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so I've think, heard people I, say that. Yeah. So I think that, like, when you ask, is adapting good? Well, I guess adapting is good for us to be able to succeed within society, mm -hmm. uh, but is it good for us as Aboriginal people to feel that balanced life? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, I always say it's not, so it's mm -hmm. something that I always strive for, mm -hmm. but, and I don't even, sometimes that, how our language has changed over time, yeah. I don't even really agree with that either. I think that we should have the old style language because 
those old style languages came with teachings and meanings and yeah. they come from ceremonies and protocols and you know that kind of thing and so mm-hmm. is, sometimes that doesn't even feel right to me mm-hmm. yeah but um, all, also the sad part of it is, and I get um, my mom uh, uh, preaches to me about this, and she said the Cree that we speak now mm-hmm. is really superficial compared to, say, 50 years ago. Well, so we're, we're, uh, there's some stuff that are, I think they're irretrievably gone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You don't, you don't hear a high, like this one, high yeah. tree spoken. Yeah. Uh, no. We don't see it. I used to work uh, at the Indian Culture College in Saskatoon. Yeah. Uh, with, uh, we bring elders in and yeah. they all talk to and tell each other and stories in their language. Yeah. Most often would be Cree. And then, of course, when you are hearing this beautiful language that you don't hear very often, yeah. uh, it's not every day it's common language, but it's a uh, oh, weak, this kind of high Cree. Yep. This kind of high Cree is uh, we're losing it. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's very regrettable because uh, I used to work away from to me, Thea, and uh, when I came back to the, the Cree, uh, it, the Cree that I, I came back to was uh, music to my ears. Yeah. It was beautiful. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I, still, I still feel that way when I, I'm in yeah. a Cree, uh, Cree speaking uh, uh, situation, and it, it just creates this sport, and it's, it's so beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think in terms of tradition, I, I mean, I was raised Ukrainian. My father's Italian. But now I'm, I touch base with my mother's side of the family. So they've taught me traditions. And there's a lot of different traditions that people do differently, especially in different families. Um, do make you there's different ways. I think we're evolving and trying to include the two spirits and all that. That's coming for sure. Um, but again, something, not everything can be taught. Not everything can be changed. It has to be experienced. So if it's something that you want to like to understand the culture, to understand the language, the tradition, don't just touch base in one area. Touch base everywhere. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, just as um, I think uh, it's my turn to shut up, but um, <clears throat> one of the things, though, that uh, I just remember from my uh, childhood days is um, the whole notion of explicit learning, something that's told to you, like this is the teaching for this. But a lot of... Um, learning was done implicitly, it was implied, how people reacted to something. Like if my, um, if my mom's um, relative was sitting there and somebody told a real off color, well, she, um, instead of, she wouldn't say anything, she would just turn away and um, she wouldn't laugh. <laughs> so. So it was that that's implicit learning, and I learned a lot of um, body language, I think, and um, a lot of other stuff through a, through a implicit learning. That too is. Um, I think kids are really um, they really sponge that up, but they're not. Um, a lot of times they can't explain the background teaching of something, but they know how to behave or how to react and stuff like that. So so I think with that, um, I'll um, 
there's a, there's a, a little, I'll end with a little story. There was this, um, there's this, this old man from Saddle Lake. He said, um, his name was Tommy Cardinal, and his mom was Katutu. And uh, she told him, she said, son, when you're walking down the path of life, you need two walking sticks. Sasko Teona, it's not they're not canes, they're walking stick. And that is to maneuver through the rocky areas, through the water, through the rough areas of life. And she said one walking stick is um your language and culture. And the other walking stick she said was um your um your education. So that's to me that's a really good um, story about biculturalism. And um, just to remember where we come from, but all the old people that I knew always say, get an education. And I keep your keep your culture and language too. Hi hi.